in the dead of night. The thunderous, verdant sea boomed, and the spitting waves crashed. The ship cut and zoomed, and the driving rain lashed. And the Roman legionaries stood below, shivering and wet, bedraggled young men, who were so keen to enlist back then in the blistering sunshine of Rome. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, they stood on their rolling, creaking boat and trembled. From a distance, they appeared majestic, powerful and bright against the dark of the night. Hundreds of red capes, a contrast against the monochrome tone of the sky, emanating power. This they were in Italy before they sailed the many miles to the land of the Celts. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, they stood on their rolling, creaking boat and trembled. As the rain eased up, leaving thick fog in its wake, there was only the clashes of the subsiding sea and the clink of armor plates. A change in weather common to here, but unknown to the mighty army from a faraway country. Frightened by the still, the navy ran their ships onto the soft, sandy beaches, and whispered commands ran to and fro, fro and to from ship to ship, faster than it takes to click. In ordered, precise, perfect rows, the soldiers dismounted, standing toe to toe, a fearsome sight by all accounts, well-drilled operation, well-oiled machine, known as the Roman army. Two hours later and there they were, reformed to form a glory. Their camp set up, pavilions large and small, sprung from nowhere, a sea of canvas. And there they waited. And there they waited, mighty army, prepared for a fierce blue enemy. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, the sentries kept watch as the silver moon flew high and trembled. They remembered the horrors told by their elders of the, of the nude blue men, eyes flashing white, screaming and cursing, chained into the fight, not feeling pain, nor fear, nor remorse, just bloodlust, a beast. Somewhere from the ocean of tents came the sound of a bugle. The men prepared, checking and rechecking their protection and armaments. Then, in the strange half-light of dawn, the men lined up, swords sang as they were drawn, the hunt was nigh. Moving out as a single fort, they clambered up the spongy grass towards the quiet sleeping fort. Hearts beating fast, adrenaline pumped and thumped through their veins. This day could easily be their last. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, as the first lark began its mournful song, they crept quickly past the sentry's post and trembled. Reaching the wooden palisade, the soldiers stopped still, their steel blades glinting, their hot breath seeming in the early morning chill. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, an in formation ready to kill, they stood silent, still, and trembled. All of a sudden, a blood-curdling scream smashed the silence. A man in dark blue fell from the sky onto the Romans, teeth bared, eyes flashing with hatred and malice. He hacked at the wall of Romans with two sickles, each one glinting in the white morning. More than more of these strange men fell upon the Romans from the palisade, determined to save their wives and children from death. Efficiently, the Romans began to attack, and Celt after Celt was dispatched. Fountains of blood flew from both sides. For a small moment it seemed as if there was a turn in the tide, but the Romans continued to draw ahead, stumbling across a blue sea of the dead. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, as man fought man, they struck out blindly and trembled. Agonised screams were heard as death swooped over, relieving some, but leaving others. From the far side of the palisade, the very fort itself, came the scream and cries of children, a sound common to the Celts. Mothers hurriedly rushed around, looking for their young. Whilst the battle raged outside, they wanted to be gone. Climbing down the cliffside on thick ropes woven of hemp, the women and children boarded coracles, even if it meant they would leave behind their loved ones, 
in the hope of escape. Men young and old were left behind to fight to the very last, to give their families a chance to escape the Roman grasp. The legionaries were winning, it was not the hardest fight, to battle an enemy who had no intention but to die. Yet, in the eerie Cornish coast, as men dropped left and right, they stood fast, short, dripping red and blue, and trembled. Safer now in their small boats, the children's cries ceased, and paddling right, then left, then right again, the mothers came to a twisted piece. A strange acceptance of the occurrence, glad to have escaped. But, rounding the headland, the screams start again. Horror, dismay, anguish, for in front of them are two galleys, a full 400 men, each ship with 50 archers apiece. The almighty Dumnoni Celts had been beaten. Exposed in their coracles, there was nothing they could do. It was but a sport to the Romans to pick off the screaming, sobbing women and children who were so close to safety. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, the sun rose high and the arrows flew across the sky. The Romans stood on their rolling, creaking boat and trembled. The next day, there were no remains of the peaceful tribe other than smouldering, smoking huts. The sweet iron smell of blood mixed with the scent of decay as a carrion crow cord, stretching its glossy black hood, beady eyes surveying the day. Moving out to sea in the shining sun, the Romans sang songs, victorious they won, red capes flying in the soft breeze, horrors of battle forgotten for now. Yet, on the eerie Cornish coast, drank fine wines, toast after toast, an image of the blue men would flash past their eyes, and still they trembled. Left on the beach, half buried in sand, lay a dolphin carved of bone, a child's toy, blemished by one small red fingerprint from one small hand.